Wow, we have a beautiful amount of attendees and excited to share this space and introduce, first of all, Joel Hamilton, who will be teaching this program. Hi, Joel, how are you today? I'm great. I'm so excited to be here. Um, this is a beautiful, beautiful, powerful program, and everyone that participates in the program is going to be so moved. It will, this program is going to be life-changing for everyone that is part of the program, and um, I'm very excited to be here and to be teaching this. Awesome. Well, thank you, because I'm sure people are going to have a lot of questions. Um, we also have Sarah Hawes on with us, who we featured a couple weeks ago for Massage. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Nice to meet everybody. All right. So she is here to also share in her passion for following this path as a massage therapist. So she's adding to her tool belt. So Sarah, we will hear from you. So that's what this is for. This time and space is really here for you to explore what a end of life doula is, which Suiha Southwest Institute of Healing Arts is now offering online and on campus as a certificate of excellence, which is also being approved to take within the integrative healing arts practitioner as um as a specialty. So bring the questions as we roll into the agenda. Um, we're really going to explore, first of all, what it means, right? What the role is, explore the pathways of becoming a doula, overview of the certificate of excellence itself. So the 100 hour chunk, the specialty. So Joel will explore what classes there are, what to expect out of each class. Course will tell you what the upcoming start dates are, and then we will invite all the Q&A so that you can get what you need. All right, so let's dive right in. I'm excited, excited to get started. So Joel, I'm gonna, you know, give you the floor since this is your, this is your lane and um, really tell us what, the role of an end-of-life doula is? So our primary function is to be available for the person that's having the experience. Our most important person in our role is the one that is transitioning from this life to the next, the next existence. So we are there to honor them, to honor their wishes, to make sure that their wishes are considered and are the most important part of the experience. You know, so many times death um, by the human species is hoarded. We keep it in the back room. We don't want to look at it. We just stick it away and tuck it away, and we never examine it. And it's never celebrated. Um, it is spoken in, in quiet voices. Um, we're afraid to speak of it with the person that's actually going through the experience. Unlike so many of our other lifetime rituals, like the birth of a baby, you know, a child coming into the world, um, a, a wedding ceremony, those things are all celebrated and honored and cherished. And the very, very most important experience that we will have as humans is the experience of death. Death is part of life. And nobody gets out of this existence without that experience. And it should be honored foremost more than anything else that happens in our life because this is the point where we actually review our life. We review our experiences. We consider what we've done in our life um, as a person that's transitioning. And it is that final focus on who we are and what we've been to others. And um, it's not celebrated. It's tucked away. And so we want to stop that kind of we don't want people to have that experience any longer. We want to bring it out in the open. We want to celebrate someone's life, their existence, all, all the things that they've accomplished, and the things that they'll take with them when they leave this planet. We can't take anything materialistically with us, but our experiences, our soul, are the, are the things that are going to go with us into the next plane. And so it's really important for us as doulas to honor, cherish, and um, 
uphold the rights of the person that's actually having the experience. The family is important, but um, families are going through a lot of grief at the time that someone is passing. And so they sometimes act out of character, they act out of emotion, they act out of anger and denial and frustration and fear. And so oftentimes they will speak their wishes and their fears rather than honoring the wishes of the person that's going through the experience. So we as doulas take on the role of being the facilitator for the person that's transitioning in from this plane to the next and holding their hand and guiding them and helping them through the experience so that they they don't, you know, when sometimes what happens is a family will try to push their personal beliefs onto the person that's having the experience. If their beliefs are different, their religious beliefs, and they don't honor the faith of the person that's actually going through the experience. So it's important at that point in life during the transitioning phase that the wishes, the faith, the beliefs of the people in the person that is transitioning, that their wishes are honored. If we don't do that, it can shake their faith and it can make that experience, that last final experience into the unknown, one of fear and one of regret. So as a doula, it's our responsibility and our role to really hold the hand and support the beliefs and um, the needs of the person that is actually having the experience. Oh, so question, um, how do you get the family on board with that? And what if the person who's transitioning or soon to transition has a diff difficult time communicating? What is the reality of that? So hopefully there's a time and a point where um, you're able to meet the person that's actually mm -hmm. having the experience. Um, you perhaps can look at notes or memoirs. We can understand what their faith is. We can um, inquire the, to the family what their path has been in the recent past or over the path of their life. Um, and the family will very openly share that with you because they'll say, well, that's what they believed and I don't agree with it, but so that can help us facilitate an understanding if the person that is actually transitioning is not able to readily communicate with us. And we can support the family by, un by making them or helping them understand the grief process, the different stages of it, and also understanding that their needs are important and will be met after the experience, during the experience, but during the experience, the most important needs are those of the person that is actually transitioning. Um, I know that I have a contract that I have all the family signed, and they agree to facilitate the needs of the person going through the experience first, and that that person's needs are foremost over theirs. And so they sign a contract saying, I understand. I teach them. I have I hold I hold meetings with them to help them understand. I listen to everybody's needs and then I help facilitate them receiving what they need to get out of the experience. Um, but help them understand that it's important to uphold the faith and experience and needs of the person that is actually dying. They Beautiful. will readily do that. Sometimes it takes a little time to get them all on board. But open, honest communication, both with the person passing and the person, the people that are the family, is really, really important. Honesty is utmost and most important. So I know that in many of my experiences working with someone that's, that's transitioning, um, they will say to me, am I dying? If they ask that question to the family, the family will say, oh, no, no, that's not what's happening. You're going to get better. This will, this will pass. You'll come home. But we know when someone is at the end of their life. And we, it's important for us to, um, to be honest with a person that asks us that question, am I dying? Yes, you are. 
I'm here to help you. I'm here to hold your hand. I'm here to help diminish the unknown and the fear of the experience. This is a rebirth. Um, if that is their belief, for some, they believe they go to heaven. Others have other beliefs. So we have to speak to them in a neutral fashion within the belief of their life, their faith. And we have to speak to, to that. That's the most important part. Sarah just had a good question, Sarah. I'm going to let you ask Joel that. All right. So my question is, uh, as a as a doula, um, do we allow ourselves to be available uh, to obviously the patient as well as the family at all hours? Like, do you provide them with your information? What what steps would you take? Because you know they, unfortunately, we all pass at all hours of the day and evening. So, what would you recommend for something like that? I think we all have to draw our own boundaries. And for some people, those boundaries are far greater than others. Some of us are committed fully. I'm not saying that having boundaries doesn't mean you're not full committed fully, but I'm saying some of us want to be there for everyone that we're working with. I personally don't take on more people or more jobs than I'm able to, to deal with when it comes to this kind of work. Mine is a very personal uh, connection to the family and the person that's having the experience. So I want to be there during those hours. I want to be there to hold the hand of the person that is going to be you know, having that experience. That's really important to me. That's not the same path that all of us will take. Some of us will have a, we have a family. We have hours that we're available. We can make appointments with the family. We can make appointments with the person that is having the experience. Um, we can create our own boundaries. They can be, some people's boundaries are different or less expanded than another doula's boundaries might be. So you have to be honest up front with the family and the person that you're working with so that they know your availability and when and if they can call you. I don't call, I don't care if I get a text at 3 a.m because this is my heart's goal, it is my heart's path, and it is my calling. And um, I'm, I am a reverend, I'm ordained, and this is the work that I have been called to do. So I have very few boundaries <laughs> when it comes to times of day, or um, whether it's early morning hours, whether it's late night, whether it's four o'clock in the morning, if I can be there, that's where I want to be. But every person has their own boundaries. And you as a practitioner, as a doula, working with families and those that are going through this experience, can set your own boundaries and your own rules that fit your heart, that fit your business plan, that fit your commitment to the process. Does that answer your question? Yes, Joel, thank you. Perfect. Well said. Um, and we do have some questions coming in. I know we like to hold them till the end, but I feel like they're so much more powerful in real time as they come up. So Marie, let me know if you'd like me to unmute you so you can ask the question live. Melissa as well. Let me know if you would like me to unmute you so you can ask the question live. Um, Joel, how long have you been a doula? Personally, I um, have been a nurse since 1980. So wow. I degree in nursing in 1980, and um, I that was in New York. I moved to Arizona in 1983. I worked for County Hospital. Um, there was the first, what I consider the first pandemic that occurred mm. in the world as we know it, which was um, AIDS and HIV. And so I saw a period of time where, in about seven month period, I lost 18 friends to AIDS and HIV. Wow. And I was there and made a commitment to every single one of them, and I held their hand as they left this plane. And um, it changed my life. And as a nurse, I saw 
hospitals turning those in need away because it was a disease, a disease that we didn't understand. We didn't know how it was transmitted. There was a great deal of fear and anxiety over even being close to someone that had AIDS or HIV. And my being a nurse, I had no fear. Um, many of my friends um, were people that were dying of AIDS. And so I decided when I saw hospitals turning people away, I decided I needed to do, to do something different. So I became an HIV traveling nurse. So I went to people's homes, a, people that were homebound. I woke them up in the morning. I got them bathed. I gave them their IV drips. I gave them their medication. I got them up out of bed, setting up in a chair. I got them their breakfast. I did all the care that they needed. And um, so I did that work for about 14 years. I sat with hundreds of people as they transitioned. And so this has really been my kind of my life plan. It wasn't something I planned. It's just something that came to me. And that's the way the universe works. The universe brings you those things that are your gifts, that are your graces, the things that um, connect you to your heart and to your purpose. Amen. Thank you for sharing your path to this, to this, you know, place of service. That's beautiful. Um, Marie, um, I'm going to actually unmute you and then Melissa, I will unmute you so that we can hear you. I believe hearing your voice would, would be special in this time and space. So Marie, let me know if you can hear us if you can say something and ask your question to Joel. Hi Becca and Joel, can you hear me? Hi, yes. Hi, awesome. Um, so I guess just my question was um, if there's a bit of a palliative care role um, with the end of life doula such as kind of you know um, helping them to I, you, I know you touched on it a little bit um, maybe just kind of like prayers. And I know sometimes with uh, palliative care roles, there's um, massaging and like helping them feel more comfortable at this end of life stage and more holistic approach type of thing. Um, is that very similar or the same thing as the end of life doula? Um, and so that was just my question. So palliative care um, borders on the edge of healthcare professionals. Mm -hmm. There are certain things within the, within the palliative care arena that it can only be offered and given legally by a healthcare professional. Our role is important to, it's important for us to acknowledge that there is a difference between a healthcare professional and a doula, someone that is there for emotional, spiritual support, as well as some of the physical things. So we are there to make them feel more comfortable. We're there to honor their spiritual wishes, perhaps offer a prayer, perhaps hold their hand, perhaps sit with them when they really need to express what they're going through. Um, we can also comb their hair. We can wash mm. their face. When they're having a hard time um, swallowing or breathing, we can be there to give them just that little bit of comfort with some water or a little bit of ice on the lips to be able to put some lip balm on their lips when they're cracked and dried and they're in pain, um, things that will make them feel more comfortable. And um, that is not really a palliative role, but it is a loving doula role. Yes. Because we're there to touch their life and bring their soul and their body to a space of comfort. And that is super powerful. Yes. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Melissa, are you there to ask your question? I have unmuted, asked you to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hi. 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 Um, I, I, I first wanted to say thank you so much for having this webinar. Um, I'm really grateful for this. This is something that I have been um, called to do and, and just now taking the steps to do it. But um, my question is this. Um, I 
I currently work for a funeral home and I also am a Reiki practitioner and I'm trying to paint a picture for how this is going to fall into place in my life. And I guess what very long story long, how, um, I guess, generally speaking, when somebody hires a, a death doula, um, I know it's going to be different for everybody, but um, is it like a certain number of weeks? It is, is it a certain number of days? And, and obviously sometimes, you know, in the final hours, but um, generally speaking, how, what's the length of time that you have to get to know somebody um, that you're hired for? Or that they're asking for. Right. It really depends on how soon the family and the person that's having the experience recognizes their need to have a doula. And okay. I, I act as perhaps a coach. Um, I act as a friend. Uh, sometimes it can be six months. Sometimes right. it can be hours. Um, oftentimes it is at the point where someone goes in to hospice care, that it's recognized that there's a need for someone to facilitate the experience for the person that's passing and for the family. Um, so right. to enter hospice care, uh, it can be from like one day to six months. Right. Um, most often it's a shorter period of time than that. Uh, so generally for most situations, it's a matter of weeks, perhaps mm -hmm. um, even a week or five days or a couple days. But generally, it's maybe a couple weeks to three weeks before um, I might actually get to meet them. But they're still coherent. Um, mm -hmm. Most of them are not. But it's important for you as a doula to be available for the family to chat with. Um, a little bit of counseling or sharing sessions between you and the family members, as well take, as taking the time to set with a person that's actually transitioning and allowing them, because they will fade in and fade out, and they will be present sometimes and present, uh, not present other times. So I really try to take the time if I'm working with someone that's hard to have them communicate with you. I like mm. to be there for a couple of days initially for a great deal of time to have, give myself the opportunity to, to catch those moments when they are coherent, when they are actually themselves, and really talk to them in a real way. Uh, so I'm not sure if that answers your question. That, that definitely did. That absolutely did. And thank you for that. And and I, I guess from your experience, would you say that um, – having a pretty open and flexible schedule. Like I, like I said before, I know that this is something I'm supposed to be doing and I'm just trying to figure out if it, if it's something where I probably would need to give up my other jobs to be flexible and open to be, be present and be there. And, and from what it sounds like that would be the case to be able to put your all into that. Not necessarily. So, I'm probably one of the busiest people I know. Yes, <laughs> you it's are. Always, it's always been that way, but I make time for those things that are important. And sure. the rest of the people and jobs in my life just have to understand that. that Perfect. <laughs> yep, I understand that completely. Yes, thank so you. I know that if I want something done, I ask one of the busiest people I know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Don't quit yeah. your day job. Well, luckily, my day job is a funeral home, and they, they're they being very supportive of this. <laughs> yeah. And just like a lot of holistic entrepreneurs, Melissa, I mean, a lot of people have their day job. They start building, you know, their clientele, um, marketing themselves. Like, it's not a, you have to jump in. It's a sure. ease into it. Go at your own pace. Enjoy the journey. Sounds like you're in the right field to do just that. So, yeah. well Thank done. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Um, Loretta, would you like to answer or ask your question live? I will allow you to speak if you feel comfortable with that. If not, I can ask your question to Joel for you. 
That's fine. I just unmuted. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello. Hi, Loretta. Um, thank you for this presentation. I'm wondering, are doulas accepted at all or most hospitals and hospices and healthcare facilities? Do you typically work there? Do you work in homes? And then who pays for it? Is it covered by any insurance or Medicare? Is it part of hospice or how does that work? So one thing to recognize is that what we do in the role that we play is completely and totally separate from the healthcare professional world. Mm -hmm. um, we are healthcare professionals, but we are we don't have that um, designation that legitimately allows us to be a healthcare professional. We are um, being accepted and being utilized in hospice care on a regular basis, and um, within the world as we know it, you know things have sh have shifted so much in recognition of the spiritual aspects of our body and our soul. It's so important now. So um, I would not suggest that you make your services available for payment from insurance companies at this point um, because that is a lot of paperwork and you better bill things perfectly. Um, and some of this care is not recognized at, by the healthcare industry yet um, as far as insurance companies. Um, but Certainly Reiki practitioners, people that do alternative health care, um, Reiki, polarity, massage, those modalities are recognized and you could certainly, if you wanted to, bill for those services. Um, I'm trying to think, that there are so many different parts to that question. <laughs> I want to make sure that I answer them all. So I, I think it's important to recognize what our role is, and to recognize that we are recog we are considered an alternative or holistic healthcare method for people that are transitioning, and hospice care absolutely recognizes who we are and finds a great need for what we do, and um, the families. Once they meet you, once you know what you're doing and what your role is, the families really cherish the connection that they have with you as well as the connection that you have with their loved ones. I don't know if I answered all those questions. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Perfectly said. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Loretta. Great question. Um, that was also Beth's question. Well, she was wondering, are hospices generally accepting of this companion service? Um, Beth, I'll allow you to speak if you feel comfortable with asking more, more on that. Uh, it was asked and answered. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. All right. Beautiful. I'm glad we have these questions coming in. That's awesome. All right. Joel, so we're at planning ceremony. We didn't really get to that part yet. Do you, would you like to expand on that? Of course. There are many death rituals that are um, practiced and celebrated in many cultures. And recognizing the culture and the beliefs and faith of each individual person and either knowing it firsthand or researching the information that you need to know once you are discovered by the parties that want to hire you. So there's a little bit of research, a little bit of work, a little bit of getting to know the culture of the person, asking questions, because oftentimes, even though they may be of a specific faith and there may be certain ceremonies that govern a faith and how this all plays out, they vary according to the individual family and person. So. Someone might have a Jew, be of the Jewish faith, and they have certain rituals that govern their faith and how this all plays out, the experience of death. Um, but there, the caveat to that faith is that each family and each individual has a little variation on that, um, a little bit different personal connection and belief and experience around the death ritual. 
And so it's really important to, uh, to get to know the family, know their faith, and be in a neutral space and be able to offer help, um, letting them find their answers. We're not there to tell them what, they're, what they should do. We are there to let them find their way and let them tell us what their needs are and how they want this to play out. And we can honor, we can facilitate, and perhaps we can be a little creative in the way that we develop the death ceremony or the ritual around that experience for each individual. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Victoria, I know you have raised your hand um, and have a question. So if you're driving, anyone who's driving, I definitely don't want you to type anything in. So please do raise your hand. Um, I'll allow you to speak if you have a question, Victoria. Um, I, 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 I have a bit of a different uh, comment to make. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, okay. we can hear you. Um, about th uh, five years ago, I was a palliative resident. I was told I wasn't going to make it except for maybe seven months. This is five years later. So I, fortunately, uh, I got better. But what really upset me when I was going through uh, being uh, palliative was people kept things from me. People, uh, uh, you know, you would say things and they would say oh no no you're going to be here next week don't worry about that i would try to make my wishes uh known and my family says why do you want to talk like that why why do you do that you you know you're just making yourself feel bad and all these kind of things like they wouldn't allow me to express what i needed to express and i i should mention that i'm also a nurse and i sometimes see the families of my patients doing the same thing and it really infuriates me they don't realize that sometimes the patient knowing what's coming and knowing it, it relaxes them they now know this is it uh, you might have a few days a few months a few weeks to live that's fine it gives them time to deal with what they have to deal with so my, my comment is, please don't hide things from people. Victoria? Yes. Victoria, you're, you're, um, you're adding that in there is such a beautiful um, contribution. Thank and you. I honor you for sharing that personal experience with everyone here. Um, I think earlier on when we first started this, I said being honest with a person that's dying is the most important thing. And I've had almost everyone that I've worked with say to me, am I dying? And my answer was yes. How can we move forward and experience everything that we need to experience unless we are grounded in truth? That's and right. I I so honor you for that. We are stealing precious time by not telling the truth and by not sharing what's really happening to those that are going through the experience. And thank you, thank you so much for that because we heal sometimes into life and sometimes our healing heals us into death. And that is not a bad thing. And I'm so glad, it's really powerful that you have survived and you're still here with us. And I think part of the bat is so that you could share that little bit of information of truth for your experience, because that's so powerful. Um, Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Wow, I got chills. Ah, beautiful. Okay, um, we have another hand raised. I will, Don, would you like to speak and ask your question? Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you all for having this webinar. I appreciate being here. I appreciate what you're sharing. Um, I wasn't gonna say anything. I just wanted to come and listen 
because I felt led to be here once I saw it in my email. And after the last woman spoke, I just was like, okay, God, I have to say something. So uh, in 2016, I carried what I call my warrior angel baby. Uh, she was diagnosed with um, trisomy 13 at 22 weeks. I was advised to have an abortion. I do not believe in abortions. Um, so I refused to. And I just trusted God throughout that process. And it was put in the notes by one of the nurses that against her advice, I was choosing my faith. And I said, absolutely, every day, all day. <laughs> and so I would never make a different decision. It was the best and most painful thing I ever had to do was to love and care for a child that everybody else wanted to discard. But my comment is more so on um, how I felt towards her last days. She did go full term and um, she lived for 40 days, about 42 days. But during that time, we would constantly have meetings about her care. And I was torn between, should I work? Should I stay here with her? Um, and I just didn't feel like I was getting clear answers from doctors to the point that I had to get my friends that were still on board with me because I had a lot of friends who showed their true colors because they didn't agree with my decision not to abort her. But anyhow, um, I had to get the friends that I had and family that I had who were still supporting my decision to come into the meeting to really hear what I was hearing because on one hand I was being encouraged to you know be the mom I was being um, to love her to care for her and I wanted to move her to another facility where I could spend more time with her but after I signed all of the paperwork um, they refused to allow her to move to the facility so I got angered and I couldn't understand why and they wouldn't just flat out say to me, she's dying. And I'm like, why won't you say it? I have a, I have a huge problem. I know that she's not going to live forever. I just am not the one who can make the decision to end her life. I have to let God take her life just like he gave it. And so it bothered me so much that these medical professionals skirted around the issue of saying to me, she's gonna pass any day. And so I would encourage any medical professionals on this um, webinar today to, if you have a patient that you know who is going to pass, don't be afraid to say it to the family, regardless of how you feel they may receive that, because they need to know that so that they can prepare themselves mentally, spiritually for what's coming. Even though they know it's gonna happen eventually, if you have any inkling that it's gonna happen today, tomorrow, or the next day, say it, because the family already knows it, but they really do need to hear you say it. They shouldn't have to go through turmoil over it because I lost, in my mind, I lost valuable time with my daughter that I could have had simply because that wasn't said. I was led to believe that I should go to work and continue to prepare a space for her at home so that she could come home. And the day that she was discharged, on the way, her father took her and I went to go get the car. On the way to get the car, I got the phone call that she had passed. And it was devastating because you wouldn't allow me to move her to this other facility where I could spend more time with her until her last breath. But you would allow me to discharge her finally knowing that she was going to die. That just broke my heart. And it's taken some time for me to get over it. But I've come to understand that we go through things for more than ourselves. And I'm accepting my role as having to have walked through that so that I can help someone else. And so that's why I'm here. I'm here because I am feeling led to become an end of life doula so that I can be that strength for somebody else because I know the pain. 
thank you again for allowing me to speak. Don, thank you so much for sharing that beautiful, beautiful, um, those, your words, your experience. Um, you know, angels are sent to us in all shapes, forms, and ages. And um, I believe your daughter was an angel that was sent here to teach you um, the experience that you had, perhaps so that you could be led to this space and time, perhaps so that you could be a voice for her as a doula, perhaps so that the experience that you had could would be an experience that one less person might have. Perhaps you can be a voice and an advocate for yourself and for your daughter. And um, this is really a beautiful role since the healthcare industry doesn't necessarily follow the same spiritual and heartfelt connection or process that we do as doulas. Perhaps that's our role. Perhaps that's a challenge that we can pick up and carry for those people that are not allowed to have the truth. Perhaps we can be that voice. I so appreciate your sharing, which you shared with us. And um, I think that that was really powerful. And I'm so sorry that you maybe didn't get as much time with your daughter, but you, you know, recognizing that you, all of us that are involved within the process of death and dying, go through stages, stages of denial, stages of anger, stages, stages of bargaining, you know, bargaining with the idea of death, and um, the process of being depressed about it, and then finally accepting that it is what is the truth. Um, I am an advocate for truth always, and I think the healthcare industry has a long way to go. Perhaps our role will help facilitate change in a really positive way for people that are going through the experience that you had. Oh. God bumps all over the place. Um, so we have more questions coming in. I know we're running out of time already. We could do this probably all evening. Um, people are asking about the curriculum, so let's just jump into an overview of the 100-hour certificate itself, which, yes, is online and on campus. So, Joel, I'll let you give us that overview pretty please. Of course. Of course, it's right here in front of us. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's such, a, such an incredibly powerful 100-hour um, uh, training process. We're understanding the process of death and dying and afterlife and how we can approach it and become, befriend the process instead of living in fear of the process. Um, we do review different theologies and varying concepts on death. We find your heart, um, your individual heart. You find your own way and belief in the process of going through our first class on death, dying, in the afterlife, and how you connect to it, how it is a part of your life, how it helps you examine why your fears are what they are, or perhaps you don't have any fear. Um, we all come to this space together to share and grow and learn from one another, and that's what the first class is all about. And then we go through, we are in the second class is life review and the process of grieving. And oftentimes when we approach death, we, as an individual going through the experience, we kind of look back on our life and we say, what did I do? What did I, did I make any significant mark? Did I change anybody's life? Did I help anyone along the way? And um, that's a real common thing. And we as doulas will help the person that's having the experience perhaps review their life, recognize um, things that they contributed to their family, to the people they love, to the experience of others who have lived with them or around them. And that's what that's all about. And recognizing that grief isn't a place where we want to live, but it's okay to visit there when we need to. And just because we experience grief and hurt doesn't mean it's a lack of faith. 
Um, mm. Grief is the cost of loving someone. We, we have love, and when that person is gone, we don't have any place to give it because the person is no longer with us. So that causes us some pain. But recognizing that that pain is the cost of our love that we have for that person and just sending it back to ourselves or other people in our life is really an incredible experience and process. And then we, we um, go into the final class, which is the end of life ritual and ceremony. And it's all about um, coaching you um, in being in a neutral space and helping others create ritual, and may perhaps families around ritual of the dying process, both during the experience and after. Um, so this process and these rituals are for the person that's actually transitioning and then perhaps for the family afterward. So it's really an in-depth discovery, but self-discovery of how you can take this personal experience that someone is having and sharing with you and help them make it their own. Beautiful. Okay. So those are it's an overview of their certificate in the classes. We have some more questions coming in that I do want everyone to be able to ask. So Kenneth, would you like to ask your question? We'll allow you to speak if you feel comfortable asking out loud. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Kenneth. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask what your suggestion would be for somebody considering myself to take this program. But I have never really experienced death and dying in my life or any family member, friends, things like that. So kind of like, am I sensitive enough for this program? What would you suggest? So if you're even considering this program, it's connected itself to your heart in some way. Mm. And it shows that you have a depth that you're wanting to explore. And this will be a different experience for every person that comes together um, in this program. Every person will take their own individual beliefs and experience and with them and It'll be a, a, a culmination of everybody's thoughts. We'll all learn from each other. I know that as a teacher, I learn as much from my students as I think I teach them. Mm -hmm. And so we learn from each other because it's really a transformational experience of the heart. And I think the mere fact that it's something you're considering is an invitation for you to come and do it, um, to be a part of the experience. And, you know, even if you don't take it to that place of being a practitioner or being an actual death doula, you'll take this information with you for the rest of your life. And it will impact you and the people you love. And it will change who you are. And um, my hope is that you can play a role in facilitating change in the world. And that can be in many, many ways. It doesn't have to be as a death doula or practitioner in this way of working with people as they die. Perhaps it's the way you show up. Perhaps it's the way you work with your family and the people that you love. Because even one life that you touch with this experience is worth it. Thank Beautiful. you. Yes, thank you. Good question. Thank you, Kenneth. All right. Um, we do have a couple more questions. Susan, I will we'll see if you would like to ask your question. Um, if you would like to speak, otherwise I can ask it out loud. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, yes. Um, well, I just had a question. I, I been, feel like I've been called to learn this because of experience that I have had in the last couple of years with my mom, with my boyfriend's mom. Um, you know, I've been very, with my mom, I took care of her for the last 10 years, but um, with my boyfriend's mom, I met her and within a week she was gone, but it was very, we had a very big connection during that time. 
And then I read about it and I'm like, I think this is what I need to be doing, <laughs> even though it doesn't have anything to do with, I, with what I've done before. But um, because of the work that I was doing with my mom and um, Mickey's mom, when you are, we had hospice with there and, you know, they take care of the person and they wash them. And I know they take care of the medication as well. So my question is how, do you work with them so you're not like stepping on their um what they need to be doing but you are able to provide that care to the person that is transitioning so i have worked um in this industry and with this role as well as the role of a um a nurse and there are clear pretty clear definitions sometimes they're a little bit of gray areas, but having a conversation with whatever hospice facility you're working with and understanding what they will do and what they will not do, and also understanding what you're capable of doing and what you're willing to do for the person going through the experience. Mm -hmm. But the, um, the difference is whether it's, you're not going to be giving anybody medication. Yeah. You're not doing anything that will um, be administration of drugs or anything of that nature. But you can offer that comfort, that voice, that ear for them to speak to. Um, you can hold their hand. You can give them the truth that they need. You can help facilitate um, a space of healing for them as well as the family and a deeper connection through the experience. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever gone through the experience of being with someone when they pass. It is very difficult, especially mm -hmm. if it's a family member, and it is a hard role to play, but it's an incredible gift because it's a gift that is not often experienced. It is a gift that the person that you're with is sharing with you, and it is a hard role to play but it's also incredibly beautiful, powerful, and rewarding because you are facilitating the transformation of one soul into its next existence. I, I'm trying to explain how death is, and it's not the end. I know that through oh, yeah. my personal experience. It's like um, a butterfly. <laughs> it's like a, a caterpillar. Um, putting itself in a cocoon and re-emerging as a butterfly and flying off in this beautiful, beautiful set of colors in their wings. And it's just um, a immersion in a spiritual journey for the person that you're working with. And um, so you will be able to understand if you facilitate conversation and communication with family, with the healthcare workers, just what your role is. And it's different for each experience because not everybody wants the same thing. But communication, talking to the family and the person going through the process and the healthcare workers on site is really the important factor in understanding what your role will be and how that will play out. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, Dominique, let me unmute you so you can ask your question. Looks like we're about to wrap it up here soon. Go ahead and ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, yes, hello. Hi, I wanna say thank you so much as well. This seminar is so beautiful and it's like something that I also feel super called to. <clears throat> and um, I wanna say everyone who's spoken, I appreciate your guys's experiences and I think you are all so strong and beautiful in your own way and I think it's amazing that we're all can be like in a community wanting to do the same thing and just such like I feel like it's just so spirit-led and I'm very thankful but my question was like once you do your certifications and you get like you know I feel like all the knowledge and you need how do you gain that experience how do you gain client like clients patients people to help so the experience within that role is part of one of the classes where we will send you out into the field 
um, working with the healthcare system, fulfilling the role of a, of a volunteer. And as a volunteer, you will be carrying on many of the duties that a deaf doula would provide. Uh, there's nothing stopping you from doing that as long as the people you're working with in the facility that you're working with allows you to do that. There's a very distinct training process that um, volunteers go through and you will benefit from that process and that training through this course. Um, and then you will begin to understand. You'll begin, to, you'll begin to embrace what your role will be. And the only deciding factor that might be out of your control is what legally you can do and what you can't do. You are the leader of your heart. You are the leader of your journey as a deaf doula. And the sky is the limit as far as how much you can help someone through the process of transitioning from this plane to the next. Um, having an open heart, being honest and truthful with yourself as well as the people you're working with, in the divine that is all-encompassing in the world, that part, whatever it may be for you, that energy in the world that gives you life and passion, that will guide you and help you find your way. We aren't all born instant death doulas or end-of-life practitioners. We are born human, and our humanity will guide us through the process of becoming a death doula. Because humanity, even though we're all human, is not that common anymore. And um, perhaps that role that we play um, in our life and the life of helping others through that process is really what our path is. I love that so much. Thank you. I agree. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, we had an anonymous question asking, is the end of life doula certificate available to do as a standalone or do I need to be enrolled in something else? And the answer is yes, you can take this as a certificate of excellence, 100 hours on campus or online start dates on campus, September 5th. You need to enroll what two weeks prior to get your spot. I mean, as soon as possible, if you feel called Trina was on, uh, she's an admissions coach. She typed in the chat. That's her direct line. I put it in the chat. You can leave a message. She'll get back to you first thing in the morning. Absolutely amazing. And then online, October 30th, that will be available. We also just found out that this will be an add-on specialty within the Integrative Healing Arts Practitioner Diploma, which is very exciting because that is a more well rounded um, program where you learn how to market yourself, how to, you know, brand yourself and really step into that role of becoming an entrepreneur. Um, certificates of excellence specifically aren't designed to be like the career oriented gainful employment path. But if you feel called to start there, this is a beautiful way to do so. We've had amazing questions today, Joel. How was that? Amazing. These We have the room uh, filled with beautiful souls. And um, when you come to class, you're going to find the experience to be incredible. And I want to thank all of you for your bravery, for your questions, for your help, your heartfelt connection to what you really want to do. I hope you find your way. Um, I look forward to seeing many of you in the upcoming class and um, blessings to you all and may you facilitate change and healing in everybody's life. Mm, amen. Well, perfect. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you all for being vulnerable, for sharing. I know the big takeaway is let's not bypass our opportunities for our spiritual experience as humans. Um, so thank you all for sharing in that important reminder and thank you joel for leading this program so that the souls yes, who've been called through their pain so and their grief can now be that guiding light in other lives so thank you